My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, What She Left Behind, Uncovering the Stories of Rochester Women, presented in partnership with the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, this program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask that audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. We'd also like to thank the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Our next program is Auto Industry History, presented in partnership with Smart Towns, which will be an in-person event on Thursday, March 28th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. Now, without further ado, please welcome our presenter, Samantha Lawrence. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to join you for Women's History Month and to talk about Rochester's women. So when I first started working at the Rochester Hills Museum back in 2016, I was fresh out of school and I had the monumental task of learning about this community's history. So this meant spending a lot of time pouring through the archives, so looking at our photographs, our diaries, scrapbooks, and through the museum's collections, I began to piece together our local history. And I also started to develop a passion for our local women and the incredible stories that they have. So on this title slide, I have one of the photos that actually first sparked my interest, and it shows local women on Main Street in Rochester. So they all also have banners um, that have different um, local businesses. So there's one that says uh, C.A. Burr Opera House. There's one for the Rochester Era newspaper. Um, there is a H.J. Taylor hardware banner. Now, I don't know a lot about the context of this photo. Um, I don't know why they had the banners or why they were in the middle of Main Street. Um, but I do know that it was taken at least sometime between 1890 and 1899. So there are two things that tell me this. The first is the building in the background. Um, that is the Rochester Opera House. So that is what is now Lytle's Pharmacy. And that was built in 1890. And then the other clue is Main Street. Um, you can see that it is um, a dirt road at that point. And so in 1899, um, the Detroit United Wail Railway came through Rochester. And when it came through Rochester, um, there were tracks that would go right down the middle of Main Street as well as power lines that would go overhead. So it was like an electric streetcar trolley system. And as you can see, there are no tracks. So that's what leads me to believe this was taken between 1890 and 1899. And so even though I don't know a lot about this image other than what I've told you, um, it is really a powerful image of Rochester's women. And thankfully, at the museum, I am surrounded by the stories of local women and um, the accomplishments of all of these women, um, not only within the archives, but also within our physical site. So I have to do a little plug and explanation of the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm. So we are a 16-acre, eight-building museum complex, and uh, we were once the site of the Van Hoosen Dairy Farm, so we have some really unique buildings. And our story centers around two really, well, I guess I should say more than two really incredible women. I'll be talking about two of them tonight. And um, just to give you an idea of some of our buildings, we have an 1850s red house, uh, which was um, lived in by farm employees. We have the 1840s Van Hoosen farmhouse, which is where the Van Hoosen family lived. We have the 1927 dairy barn, uh, which was where they would milk the cows, and it is where we have our exhibits and our offices now. There's the 1848 schoolhouse, which educated the students in Stony Creek Village. We have the 1927 calf barn, which is where we now host programs and lectures and weddings. And then our newest building, which is the equipment barn. So uh, there was an equipment barn on the property, and the original building dated back to 1924. And over the past couple years, we were able to get a replica um, reconstructed, and we use it 
um, partially for storage and partially for exhibits. Um, so we have some really incredible buildings that have a lot of history. And so my role within the museum is I'm the archivist. So I always like to um, explain what an archivist does. I find there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, there is this quote by Lisa Lewis, and I think it really captures uh, what I do. She says, archivists bring the past to the present. They are record collectors and protectors, keepers of memory. They organize unique historical materials, making them available for current and future research. So this is, in essence, what I get to do every day at the museum, and that involves a lot of different activities. So one of the major things that I work on is expanding our collections. So I work with donors from the community to add local history material to our archives. And then once that stuff is on site, we work to preserve it. So uh, we want to make sure that this material is around for years to come. So we put it in acid-free boxes. We have climate-controlled storage spaces, which is it's really tricky to uh, keep our really historic buildings, especially a dairy barn, climate-controlled. But um, we are continuing to work on it. And then I always say that uh, the most important part of my job is to make sure that I'm not the only one who sees what we have in our collections. So there's no point in preserving all of that if we're not going to share it with the public. And so this is where creating access to our collections comes in. And we do this in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the biggest things we do is we digitize our collections. So we put a lot of our digitized materials on a website called Oakland County Historical Resources. It's a really fantastic website, and we actually have our digitized newspaper collection on there. That is probably, I would say, our most valuable thing that we have. It dates back to 1873, and the newspapers are fully searchable, so if you wanted to search someone's name or a particular location, you can type that in, and it makes the research process so much easier. Um, and then another way that we provide access to our collections is through cataloging. So uh, just like the library, we have a catalog at the museum, and we try to keep record of all the items in our collections. Um, so of course, we know where they're located, what condition they're in, kind of the stories behind them, but also so we can share that with the public. And we have a way to make a part of our collections catalog available so that everyone here can research in it, which is really fantastic. And I have to say, I couldn't do any of this without our volunteers and interns. We have a really wonderful group of dedicated volunteers that help us um, do a variety of things, digitizing, cataloging, transcribing, and um, they're really the reason that we're able to um, get so much out in the public, and they're the reason behind a lot of the stories that I'll tell you today and why I know about them. And then the last component of my job is what I'm doing today, advocacy and outreach. So we're always looking to advocate for the archives and share um, you know, with the public in um, unique ways. Um, we do presentations like this. Um, we add, try to add in local history to our educational programs at the museum. Um, another fun way that we've um, kind of brought our collections to the community is in downtown Rochester, we have back in the day signs and they show an archival photograph um, and so you can see kind of what a certain area looked like um, back in the day. Um, and those are really fun to create um, and just to see how things have changed or how things have stayed the same. And so the idea for this presentation has come about kind of organically um, after years of uncovering stories about local women. Um, as an archivist, I love being able to use the archives and use historical material to tell stories. So I spend this whole program just talking about these women and giving you a kind of biography of their life, but I wanted to add in another element. So I wanted to show you how we discovered these women and their stories, and then also do a little show and tell with some things that I brought out of the archives. And before I jump into the first woman, um, I wanted to note that there are so many women that I'm leaving out with this presentation. Um, there, I could probably do a dozen different versions of this presentation and have different women every single time. So um, I've chosen these women because they all kind of have a connection with each other. And then um, I was uh, there when we were discovering their, these stories. So I'm able to provide kind of a, a more behind the scenes look. And my hope is to continue researching local women and to be able to do more versions of this presentation and highlight new women every time. 
So let's start with the story of two Ellens. So this is essentially a story about how a resource left behind by one woman helped us uncover the story of another woman. And they both, of course, happen to be named Ellen. So in the archives, we have a pocket diary from 1864, this little thing right here. And it provides a glimpse into what life was like in the greater Rochester area. Um, in 1864. And of course, this is uh, a really interesting time period, you know, during the Civil War. And based on the names mentioned throughout, we believe that this diary belonged to a young woman named Ellen Madison. She was um, 18 years old at the time when she wrote it. So Ellen's diary has always been really intriguing to me. Um, just the fact that we get to have the perspective of a young girl, you know, living in the area. And it became especially important last year when we were celebrating Stony Creek Village's bicentennial. So when Ellen wrote this diary, she was living in Stony Creek Village with her family. And for anyone unfamiliar, Stony Creek Village is located off of Tinkin, um, kind of near Washington Road and Avon Players. It's where the museum is located. And it was its own community within Avon Township. And as part of our bicentennial celebration last year, we did a lot of research in the archives and I spent a little bit more time with Ellen's diary. Now, I have to say Ellen's diary isn't the most exciting historical material. Her entries are very brief and very matter of the fact, um, but sometimes we do get a glimpse of how Ellen was feeling. So on February 13th, 1864, she wrote, there is no school today, and we have plenty of work to do, and it is very lonesome, and I do not know what we shall do when school is out entirely. And then she also frequently mentions other people living in the community. So on January 3rd, she writes about the death of Stony Creek Village resident Os Van Hoosen. She wrote, last night, Os Van Hoosen was frozen to death between here and Rochester. He went away yesterday noon and was not found until nearly noon today. Um, so every person that she mentions is sort of like a clue that helps us learn the story of another, um, you know, Stony Creek Village resident or local resident. And um, if anyone's familiar with the Van Hoosen family story, I believe Os Van Hoosen was Joshua Van Hoosen's brother. Um, and he is the father to the next person I'll be talking about, Bertha Van Hoosen. And I think um, with his death, I think there was alcohol involved and that was caused him to um, not get back home in time. Um, but when I was reading a few more passages, there was a name that really stood out um, and it caught my interest. So on January 5th, she wrote, today is Os Van Hoosen's funeral. I stayed at the house with Ellen Kitchen. Elden, Elder Johnson preached the funeral sermon and they liked it very much. So after reading this, I was really curious about who Ellen Kitchen was. And that's when I turned to the museum's um, collection database. I wasn't sure if we would have anything in there, but I, it was worth a try. And I ended up finding this photograph. Um, it was simply labeled as Ellen Kitchen. And I think this might be the same Ellen Kitchen that is mentioned in the other Ellen's diary, which was really exciting. But of course, I, this didn't tell me that much more about her other than what she may have looked like. So that is when I uh, went to the census records and I found her listed under the household of George Lomason. So George Lomason was the proprietor of the Lambertson House, um, and that was a hotel at the southwest corner of Main Street and University Drive. And you can see at the bottom, there is an advertisement from the Rochester newspapers um, for the Lambertson House. It was, um, I think, a pretty active establishment. Uh, we have several different things um, in the archives about parties that were held there. We have a flyer that you can see on the screen for a New Year's ball that was held in 1869. And then the little green ticket down there is for um, a New Year's event they had in 1872. And so this was just a really exciting discovery because it led me to learn that Ellen was um, you know, living at George Lomason's and she was a servant there. And of course, this wasn't a ton more information, but it was still really interesting to learn about a woman that I had never heard of. And I think in the end, this just is kind of a quick example of how we can use the archives to uncover um, our local women's history. 
And I also wanted to point out, since we're dealing with a handwritten diary, that uh, we have a few volunteers at the museum that are helping us transcribe a lot of our letters and uh, diaries and other handwritten things. And this is very tedious work. Um, you know, reading other people's handwriting is not for the faint of heart. So I'm eternally grateful to them. Um, they are so enthusiastic. And one of my volunteers, she can only handle uh, four hours a week split into two hour shifts because it's just so much trying to read their handwriting. But by transcribing all of these things, we're able to explore the local history even more. So um, I couldn't do, I couldn't share this story without their help. And so the exciting thing is many of the women I'll talk about today are kind of interconnected. And um, Ellen Madison is actually related to our next woman, Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen. And so Ellen and Bertha were cousins. And so you may be familiar with Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen. She's one of our more famous historical figures. Um, and it's actually her birthday today. So happy birthday to Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen. She was born on this day in 1863. And so she was raised in the local community. She grew up in Stony Creek Village. Um, when she became an adult, she went to the University of Michigan and she got a medical degree. Um, and then she went on to practice medicine. Um, her primary practice was in Chicago. And she was practicing medicine in the late 1800s. And of course, this was at a time when women were not in the medical field. So she faced countless obstacles because of her gender, but it never really stopped her. And I think her main goal was always to pave the way for other women in the medical field. She had what she called her surgical daughters, and she would travel all over the world to visit them and to provide mentorship um, for them. Um, and then she had a 50 year, I think it was more than 50 year career. Um, and she of course accomplished so many things. Um, just a couple things. She pioneered the use of scopolamine morphine anesthetic during childbirth. She was one of the co-founders of the American Medical Women. And although her practice was primarily in Chicago, she would come back to this area and stay with her family and see patients here. So the little prescription pad you can see on here, it has her listed as in Rochester, and then it has the Chrisman Pharmacy um, listed on there as well. And one of the things I really admire about Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen is she was always trying new things and looking for new experiences. And at the age of 84, um, Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen set off on another adventure to publish her autobiography, Petticoat Surgeon. Um, I have to read this description that was from a Chicago, a Chicago Tribune ad. Um, it's, um, it's just too good. It says, trust a lady of 84 who's dashed about the world with her black bag for 60 years, delivering babies, doing delicate operations in the midst of earthquakes, and above all, daring to be a woman in a man's world, to turn out this tart account of her life in medicine. Dr. Van Hoosen, at 84, writes her zestful story with a disarming frankness and with wit as keen as her scalpel. So um, with that kind of review, it's no surprise that it ended up being picked up by the People's Book Club, which meant that there were 100,000 copies that were published. And it was actually on bestsellers lists for quite some time. But I think the greatest triumph for Bertha within all of this was when the Chicago Public Library chose Petticoat Surgeon to be printed in Braille. And you can actually see a picture of Dr. Bertha at the bottom um, with a woman who has the Braille edition in front of her. And then another really interesting um, um, ad adventure, I guess, um, came in 1949 when um, the book was translated into Danish. So there was actually a Danish woman doctor who um, helped facilitate this. And when the Danish translation came out, um, the publisher invited Dr. Bertha Van Hoosen to Copenhagen, which presented her with an opportunity to do something she had never done before, which was to travel by plane. So at 84, she um, got, well, I think she was 86 at this point, she got the opportunity to fly by plane. And her niece, Sarah Van Hoosen Jones, um, shares this story in her autobiography. Sarah wrote, like her father, Bertha had always been afraid of heights. She often said she wished there might be an anti-gravity invention to make flying safer. But suddenly at 86, she decided to fly to Copenhagen. I, being of the same mind regarding heights and flying, thought to remonstrate. However, 
I finally decided that if she was courageous enough to fly the Atlantic at 86, it was not for me to interfere. In choosing her traveling companions, who proved to be two young women whose birth she attended, she remarked, it is best to travel with people you really know. And we actually have a photo of Bertha um, that you can see on this slide um, right before her first flight with her wonderful traveling companions. Uh, so in the middle, that's Clarissa Narrett, um, who was a junior at the Women's Medical College. And then the woman on the right is Helen Taylor, who is a well-known portrait painter. And I have to give a shout out to our volunteer, Ron Megan. Um, he was the one that brought this story back up, to, um, back up to me. He was doing some cataloging and digitizing in the archives. And we actually have another photo from this same trip. And we were kind of starting to talk about it. And um, I found this story again in Sarah's book. So I decided to include it today. So like I said before, I couldn't do all of this without our wonderful volunteers. Um, but so Dr. Bertha, she uh, went on her uh, first flight and she had a fantastic time in Copenhagen. The publishers paraded her around to all different things and she had another really wonderful adventure. And the really cool thing is we have um, a lot of um, things in the archives. So the photo on the screen of her um, getting on the flight, it actually is in the Van Heusen farmhouse in the living room. And then we also have many different editions of Petticoat Surgeon. Uh, this one actually was um, given to Alice. So Alice, the, uh, the Van Heusen Farm second, and said to Alice Sorrell, the backbone of our farm. And then the wonderful thing that I just discovered, we also have the Danish translation in the archives fun way to kind of have that physical representation of these stories that we read about um, in their autobiographies. And of course this is only a small piece of what Dr. Bertha Van Heusen left behind. I really think that her biggest legacy though was um, the impact that she had on other women in not only the medical field but just locally and in general. Um, but one of the women that she, I think she impacted the most was her niece, Dr. Sarah Van Heusen Jones. So Sarah was the only daughter of Bertha's sister, Alice. Um, and like her mother and her aunt, she uh, was born in Avon Township in the Van Heusen farmhouse. And unfortunately for Sarah though, by the time that she was five years old, she lost both her father and her grandfather, which meant that she was raised by the women in her life. So her grandmother and namesake, Sarah Taylor Van Heusen, her mother, Alice, and her aunt, Bertha. Uh, and throughout her school years, she lived in Chicago where her aunt was practicing medicine. But in the summers, she would spend um, in her favorite place in the whole world, which was her grandparents' farm on, in Stony Creek Village. And so from a young age, Sarah started to develop a passion for farm life. In the archives, we have these really wonderful scrapbooks that show Sarah farm. You can see a few of the pictures on here. Um, you can see her always surrounded by pets, um, feeding piglets. There's one where she's, um, the, the top one over here, she is um, riding on a carriage. She has her dog next to her, and that is her beloved pony named Ned Toodles. Um, and you can just see from all these photos that Sarah really loved the farm, and that was really where her heart was. And so, as Sarah went through school, she um, finished her undergrad at the University of Chicago, and she was faced with that difficult decision of what to do with the rest of her life. And her mother and her aunt kind of expected her to follow in her aunt's footsteps and become a doctor, but Sarah had different ideas, and she asked them how long it would take her, working as a doctor, to save up money to buy a dairy farm. And that's when they realized her heart was not in the medical field, so instead of attending medical school, she went to the University of Wisconsin, where she received a master's in animal husbandry and a PhD in animal genetics. And although she was obviously very much um, immersed in the academic side of agriculture and breeding and running a farm, her goal was always to come back and take over her grandparents' farm. She always knew that that was going to be what, what she did. She didn't want to become a professor or anything like that. 
and her dream was realized in 1927 when she took over the full management of the farm. Um, and then the Van Heusen farm became a um, nationally and internationally known dairy operation. They sold bowls to Costa Rica, Venezuela. Uh, they had a variety of um, milk products. They had cottage cheese, ice cream. We have um, hundreds of those little milk caps in the archives for the various um, products. And uh, she was um, very involved with the agricultural industry. She was on the board of trustees for Michigan State um, University, or the precursor, and uh, she also was one of the first women in Michigan to be named a master farmer. And so, although she was really busy with farm life, she remained active in the local community. She was on the school board for the Stony Creek School. Um, she was a member of the local zoning board, um, and she was a member of the Rochester branch of w the Women's National Farm and Garden Association. Um, a couple other of her passions were genealogy and local history. She actually wrote for the Detroit Genealogical Society. And so when 1935 rolls around and Avon Township is celebrating its centennial, it's uh, no surprise that she decided to partake in the festivities. Uh, so this was a celebration that happened over four days in June of 1935. Hundreds of people came to celebrate um, downtown Rochester was transformed. You can see in one of the photos on here, there's um, amusement rides on Main Street, and the building in the corner is Home Bakery, to give you an idea of the vantage point. They had street dancing, they had multiple parades, and to honor the past, they did a Century of Progress exhibit in one of the local shops. And then they also had uh, what they called the Ye Old Curiosity Shop where they had relics from early residents um, displayed kind of as a museum. And we actually have the ledger book for that uh, ye old curiosity shop. So Sarah was a part of the store committee and I found this book in the archives. Let me just get to the page. And we have this cute little photo. It's kind of hard to see obviously, but you're welcome to come up afterwards. And it shows uh, the four women that were a part of the historical committee. There was Sarah Van Hoosen Jones, Susie L. Fox, uh, Kezi L. Haddon, Lulu Newman, and Alice Sorrell. And in the book is documentation of what each resident um, loaned to the curiosity shop. So this page uh, is for Mrs. Mark Axford, who I'll actually be talking about a little bit later. And she uh, loaned a songbook that was 133 years old, um, a bunch of baby clothes that were over 50 years old. So just a variety of things like that. And so um, Sarah also talks in her book about the uh, Avon Township Double Jubilee, which is what they called it. And she talks about the historical parade. Uh, so she wrote, the parade consisted largely of floats representing the various business firms of Rochester, as well as some of the nearby farms. Now was the time when attics were ransacked for old clothes, as were the lofts of barns and tool sheds for old buggies, carts, and wagons. And you can actually see on the screen the bottom photo here is the Van Heusen farm float. And I love it because they have a cage of chickens on top of the car. I think that's a real cow. I've looked at the photo so many times and I just feel like it has to be a real cow. The um, men on there are Van Heusen farm employees. They're in their white suits, which is what they would use to milk the cows. And you can even spot a little surge milker on there as well. And so after the Avon Township Double Jubilee, there was of this lingering interest in local history, and that interest turned into the formation of the Pioneer Society of Avon Township. And a year after the Avon Township celebrated its centennial, they had their first meeting, and they continued to meet on an, a yearly basis. And actually, just last week, one of our interns, Ashley Rotarius, she found uh, the Pioneer Society's ledger book and uh, it had all of their minutes in there, which was a really fantastic discovery. She's working on processing the Rochester Avon Historical Society's collection, so this was what she found in there. So that is something that I hope to bring out in the future to share. And it was no surprise to us, though, that Sarah was actually the first president for the organization. She was obviously very much into the local history. And then 
she was also obviously through all of her um, engagements within the community very familiar and acquainted with a lot of people and she made a lot of friends um, with other women including our next woman who is Helen Southgate Williams and we actually have um, some photos here of Helen of Helen and Sarah I should say from um, 1967 this is the dedication of the Helen Williams Children's Book Collection and the Margaret Norton Children's Room um, at the Avon Township Public Library. So Sarah was the one who introduced her. But let's rewind a little bit and talk about what led to the Children's Book Collection being named after Helen. So uh, Helen moved to Rochester in 1938 and her dream was always to bring the magic of reading to everyone, especially children. She was throughout her lifetime a children's literature professor, a bookstore owner, and a literature consultant. So she devoted her life to books. And throughout the Metro Detroit area, Helen was famous for her master storytelling. In 1948, she developed a uh, story hour program for the Youth Center in Rochester. So every Tuesday, she would read beloved and timeless tales from children's classic literature to a large group of our local children. And over the years, she became affectionately known as the story. Um, this quote from a 1972 article um, explains Helen's talent. She said, if you let her, Helen Williams will take you into the worlds of Alice in Wonderland, Peter Rabbit, Jemima Puddle Duck, or any other storybook character you might you might care to name. And then in 1964, she opened a bookshop in Rochester called The Bookstall, and it was located at 436 and a half on Main Street. And you can see a photo of the bookstall on there. You can see Helen, she's pouring tea to a patron. Um, the books in her shop were described as those written with style and grace and depth and something extra that compels a child to read a book at the dinner table, say, or under the bed covers with a flashlight after his parents have tucked him in. And so the bookstall was a haven for readers for more than 10 years. And uh, given Helen's uh, background, it's no surprise that one of the cutest things I found in the archives belongs to her. And it is this teddy bear right here, whose name is Randolph, or Dolphy for short. And I actually just found a photo of her with Dolphy, and I didn't have enough time to slip it into the presentation. But Dolphy was actually um, a little bit famous himself. He was one of 25 winners of the 1984 Teddy Bear Calendar Contest um, that was put on by Workman Publishing Company. So he received a trip to New York, $100 and 10 free calendars. And I found a letter in the archives that um, was sent to Helen from the publishing company. And it said, I basically reassured her that he had plenty of company on his trip to New York, and they would also call her once to reassure her of his safety. Um, and then he was actually, uh, a photo of him with the other winners was actually made into a jigsaw puzzle. So, of course, stories like that aren't essential to our local history. It's not going to make you understand more about the area, but I love finding little things like that. It just helps to make us smile. And so Helen, in 1946, Helen was actually featured in a local newspaper column, Rochester. Uh, the Women of the Week column was something I discovered kind of by accident. Um, I was just doing research in the local newspapers um, on something completely unrelated, as it always happens, and I stumbled across it. It began in 1946, and it was written by Helen Swords, who was one of the owners of the Rochester era newspaper. In her inaugural article, um, she described her column. She said, opening this week is a series of articles designed to give credit and proper appreciation to women of Rochester and vicinity, to be known as Woman of the Week. The column will bring you a personality each week from among the women active in the community who have contributed in an outstanding manner to the development and advancement of various community projects. In addition to a brief sketch of her background, there will be included one of her favorite recipes, which has proven particularly pleasing to her guests and helped make her an outstanding hostess. Now you have to remember this is the 1940s, so not surprised that there's a recipe thrown in there. 
But when I discovered this column, I really realized that this was such an important resource. Um, and I ended up learning about uh, a dozen local women through this column, many of whom I had never heard of. So I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I thought I would quickly run through uh, a few. So of many roles, uh, when I discovered the column, oh, sorry. Lost my, lost my spot. Um, she was a mother, uh, teacher, director, actress, and church leader. She moved to Rochester in 1942, and she joined several local organizations, such as Avon Players, Christian Forum Players, and Tuesday Musicale. There was also Lucille Warren. So Lucille worked as a um, secretary before opening her own clothing store in Rochester. The shop was called the Lucille Shop, and it could be found on Main Street. And then another uh, business owner was Alice Rosenquist. Uh, she uh, had a childhood love of art, and that's what led her to open the Village China Shop. So it was actually when her children moved out of the house that her husband um, and her opened their shop at 329 Main Street. Um, according to a newspaper, it was a favorite place for the passerby to drop in and linger unhindered among the tables and shelves of choice pottery in China. And within five years, it had become so successful that they opened a second store at the corner of Rochester and Auburn Road, which they called the China House. The column also featured Winifred Hobart. Uh, she was one of the first women in Michigan to become a licensed mortician. And after witnessing her husband help the community as a mortician, she was inspired to do the same. Um, so Winifred and her husband, Al, became partners in the Hobart Funeral Chapel, which was once located at 4th and Walnut Street in Rochester. But my favorite discovery by far from this column was May Axford. So I found names sprinkled through so many different newspaper articles documenting her very, very active life. She served the local Red Cross for 22 years. She made over 100 quilts. And the quilts you see on that screen, that is her 100th quilt that she made. And she was uh, a member of at least eight different organizations. But the coolest thing that I found about her was that she was the proud owner of night blooming cereus and cactus plants. Um, very unusual, not what I um, expected to find. Um, and again, this came to my attention by a small little paragraph in the local newspaper, and I wanted to see what else I could find. And as it turns out, from 1908 to 1948, the Rochester era newspaper chronicled the, um, the, the blooms of her plants. And so her plants bloomed for a single night once a year, so this was a very exciting occasion. And to celebrate, she actually invited people over to her house. In 1931, there was a reported 50 Rochester residents that came to her house to witness the blooms. Um, and there was another article that said that the plant was a thing of beauty, the sight of which was worth going a long distance to see. Um, so after finding these articles, I was curious what else we had about May. You know, surely with someone as active as she was, we had to have more in the archives. And I was so excited when I found this photograph in our collections. Um, it shows May Axford uh, with Elna Plassey. And I think that is one of May's beloved plants there. Um, and it's always a treat to find a photograph. You know, it's not, um, I would say, common to find photographic evidence of really wonderful stories. So um, this was especially, um, especially cool to find in our collections. And I do have to say, May's house at 429 Walnut is still standing. Um, I believe it is a salon today. And then right down the street from May was a, uh, another local woman who was making history. So this story starts with a scrapbook that we found in the collections. And we sometimes have these kind of mystery items in the collections. We don't really know a lot about them, don't know who made them, where they came from. And this scrapbook was one of those. So we weren't sure who actually took the time to paste all the newspaper articles. There was a bunch of cards. There was some ribbons, certificates, things like that. So one of our interns at the time, Chelsea, she kind of went into detective mode, and she looked at the scrapbook a little bit more closely. And 
we decided that this must have been the scrapbook of Jesse Stackhouse, who was the first woman postmaster in Rochester. Um, Jesse was born in 1890. Uh, she spent her early life in Mount Pleasant, and in 1917, she began working for the United States Postal Service in Detroit. Uh, she then married James Stackhouse and moved to Rochester in 1924. And like many of the women um, I've talked about already, she became very active in the community. And she also joined the staff of the Rochester Post Office. And then by 1935, she was appointed postmaster. And she was the 24th postmaster in Rochester's history and the first woman to be named um, and taken in that role. Um, and while she was postmaster, she really saw a lot of growth within the community, but also she um, helped the post office achieve first class status. Uh, she doubled its employees. And then they also saw a $50,000 increase in stamp receipts. But I think one of the biggest events that happened was the construction of the new post office building in 1938 um, at Walnut and 4th Street. And so this allowed them to have more space um, than the old one, um, which was located on East 4th Street. Uh, Jesse mentioned that there was plenty of room for their two carriers, their auxiliary carrier, a parcel post truck, and everything. She said there will even be a restroom for the clerks. Um, and so this was a really exciting um, addition to the Rochester community. It um, not only symbolized growth for the post office, but for the community as a whole. And so they made the dedication a really big event. Um, it was held, I believe, in June um, of 1938, and it drew a crowd of 2,500 people, and it included a parade from the old post office to the new post office. Um, and this is a lot of what Jessie chronicles in her scrapbook. Um, so we have some photos of, I think, the staff on the steps over here. Um, the one photo of all the people walking, I believe that is Jesse leading the parade to the new post office. And then the tiny little photo in the corner up there, that was the parade um, on Main Street. And in the background is actually Naps. Um, and so her uh, scrapbook really kind of helps to tell the story. And there's all of these little cards in the scrapbook, and I think those were what were attached to the flowers that we saw on the previous slide. Uh, so there was one that was from the Ferry Morse Seed Company. There was one that was from um, the Van Hoosen Farm, so from Sarah Van Hoosen Jones. And what I love about scrapbooks in general is, you know, sometimes there's a theme to them, but then there's also those random little things that are popped in there. And you can see there is an article about Sarah Van Hoosen Jones popped down below that po photo of the post office. Um, unfortunately, though, Jesse um, was not postmaster for very long. She passed away in 1945, and it was really a shock to the community. Um, on the day of her funeral, all businesses closed from 2.15 to 3.30 um, to give employees um, the opportunity to attend. Um, and then the, the local Rochester newspaper wrote the following. It said, the rebirth of industry in Rochester brought about the great growth, but her initiative and determination to have the office rate as high as possible caused her to take steps which won the cooperation of large industrialists until her goal of a first class post office was reached. In addition to her duties as postmistress, Mrs. Stackhouse always was deeply interested in the civic and religious activity of the community life and contributed freely of her time and effort in the promotion of things for the betterment of the village. So Jesse obviously had a huge impact on the community, you know, the, the relatively short time that she was here. Um, and she really had a hand in its history. And so much so that our next woman actually interviewed Jessie for a thesis that she did on the history of Avon Township. So Eula Prey um, also wasn't in Rochester for very long, and she actually moved away the year that Jessie died in 1945. And when she moved away, she left behind the most detailed history of Avon Township that had been written up to that point. And this is still um, a resource that we use today. I use it all the time. Um, but Eula came um, only a, a little bit before that. She was only in the community for uh, a little over 10 years. She came in 1934, where she began working at Rochester Junior High School. So for 11 years, she taught geography and history in the school district. 
um, and a article mentioned that she endeared herself with hundreds of young people, both in school and out. Uh, she directed a lot of uh, productions put on by the schools as well as the First Congregational Church. And while in the Rochester area, she was working towards a master's degree from the Colora Colorado State um, College of Education. And for her topic, she chose the history of Avon Township. And so her thesis explored a lot of different topics, um, things like public improvements to cultural developments, uh, you know, public and health welfare. And during her research, she was interviewing a lot of people in the community. Um, I mentioned she interviewed Jesse Stackhouse. She also corresponded with other prominent women, so Sarah Van Hoosen Jones, Matilda Dodge Wilson. And we actually have a collection of her notes and her correspondence in the archives. Um, and I have a few over here. Um, I loved going through these, and I could probably spend hours going through them, but she would, they're written on tiny little pieces of paper. And she has kind of the subject at the top and then the source at the bottom. Um, one of them here is uh, just labeled dentists. And it says, Dr. Frank Spencer gave no anesthetics the false teeth he made didn't fit, was George's father. And this was from um, Miss Elizabeth Case, who she interviewed in 1944. Um, I also just found this one that was um, about the Pioneer Society of Avon Township. And it mentioned that it was organized in 1935 during the Avon Township Double Jubilee. And it mentioned that Sarah Jones, Linda Hawkinson, Mary Thompson, and May Axford were actually officers. And this was something that she got from the community's minutes. Um, so it's just really interesting to see kind of that process that she went through to write her thesis. And then when her thesis was complete, the local Rochester era newspaper approached her about publishing it serial in their issues. Um, but unfortunately, there was a dispute with a competing uh, newspaper which halted the project and it was never published um, in that way. But thankfully, if we fast forward 40 years, the Avon Historical Preservation Committee was formed, and their intention was to preserve local records and make them accessible to the public. So at that time, a local genealogist, Sally C. Slick, uncovered Eula's thesis, and they received funding, um, and they were able to publish her thesis as um, a book titled History of Avon Township, 1820 to 1940. And they had a big uh, book debut gala at Meadowbrook Hall in 1986. And at that time, Eula expressed that her greatest hope was that someone would complete her work so that the history of Avon Township area will be preserved forever. And again, this is just another um, example of how research is never really done. We're just kind of continuously building on you know, what was done before us. And I look at Eula's thesis as such a wonderful foundation for us to continue to build our local history. And there are so many local organizations and historians that are continuing what she started um, and trying to document and preserve the history of the greater Rochester area. And this sort of collaboration pops up in nearly every aspect of our local history. Um, we, of course, see this today with all of our wonderful organizations, but we see it 100 years ago, too. Um, and there are so many examples in the archives of women working together to make this community a better place. Um, and I love to see photos um, and find evidence of them gathering um, and enjoying themselves. And, um, these are some of my favorites. This is the Christmas gathering of the Rochester Business Women's Club. Um, it, the gathering was actually held in the Van Hoosen Farmhouse. So if any of you are familiar, um, the one where they're seated at the table, um, it's Dr. Bertha Van, Van Hoosen that is carving the turkey in the background. Of course, they made the surgeon carve the turkey. And then you can see the hospitality plaque in the living room behind her. Um, and I really love these photos because it shows the women eating together. You can see them singing in one of the photos, um, cleaning up, and then also laughing together. And there was really a sense of hospitality with these women, and it really fostered connection and friendship. And for the Van Hoosens in particular, um, hospitality and gathering was an integral part of their uh, renovation of their farmhouse in the 1920s. Um, Sarah wrote in her book, she said, so the dream house was not and has not been a place for the family's enjoyment alone, but rather we have tried to share our pleasure. 
And I think this was a sentiment that was held community-wide. Um, you know, every single newspaper issue I, I look at has uh, women hosting their organizations or friends or the community in their own homes. And so my final reflection is that uncovering the stories of local women is a group effort. Um, it's not something that can be done by just one person. Um, and as you've heard in this presentation, there's so many people that have had their hand in um, you know, uncovering these stories of these local women. And if you're interested in uh, uncovering some stories yourself, I encourage you to look at the resources that are here at the library, over at the museum, or online. Um, you can check out the museum's uh, resources at rochesterhills.org slash musarchives. That, I just thank you so much for listening to me and you are welcome to come up and look at all these items. I do ask that you do not touch, that's the archivist in me, we got to keep them around for a long time. Um, and I also encourage you if you ever have any local history questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help and hopefully guide you in the right direction.